All right, so let's take a look at Stanley Frodsham and his prophecy. First, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to do my commentary and show you where I find this in the Bible. And he says, and I quote, With great judgments will I plead with the population of this country. Now, he was from England, and he was in the United States when he gave this, so just keep that in mind. With great judgments will I plead with the population of this country. Great darkness is coming upon the countries that have heard my gospel, but no longer walk in it. My wrath shall come upon them. The darkness shall be so great and the anguish so sore that men will cry out for death. And the anguish so sore that men shall cry out for death and shall not find it. There shall be a lingering death, famine, and great catastrophes. Now, where have we read this before? Well, let's take a look. All right, let's go to the book of Revelation. We're going to read from chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. Is there a place in the Bible where it talks about people wanting to die and not being able to die? Oh, yeah. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded. Now, this is during the tribulation period, people. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, when they talk about stars, oftentimes they're talking about angels, because obviously the sun in the sky, you, you know, you're not going to give the sun in the sky a, a key to the bottomless pit. So when they're talking about the star, they're talking about angels. So they're talking about an angel here. You can read Job uh, chapter 38 about the stars. And uh, if you want to know about stars, God's angels, his faithful angels, those are the stars you ought to be paying attention to and not dancing with the stars on TV or Hollywood stars. So, and I saw a star fall, fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Sounds like a, a, a volcano erupting. I don't know if you know it, but there was a volcano once that erupted where the summer turned into winter. There was that much soot and ash in the air. There was no growing season that year. I mean, can you imagine? Volcanoes have that much power. Verse 3. Yeah, you can read about it in Europe. The summer that never was. I mean, it was snowing in July. They had no crops that year. Many people starved to death. It's in history, people. Look it up. Verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. What would you rather have in your forehead, the seal of God or the, the mark of the beast? Dumb question, right? Verse 5. And to them it was given, 
And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So this prophetic words that this guy mentions so far seems to kind of line up. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. All right, let's continue. So, let's face it, people. Europe and the United States have heard the gospel, and they used to walk in it. I mean, you had people like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Finney, uh, you know, in the United States, we had a lot of, you know, you had the Wesleys. You had all kinds of people, and America and Europe, and England too. England had Spurgeon. Uh, you, they heard the gospel and they believed it. Now, the United States and England print more Bibles than any other country in the world, but they're among some of the most wicked. So, his prophecy said God's wrath will come upon them, and the darkness will be so great. And he says there's going to be lingering death, famine, and great catastrophes. So, where do we read about this? Revelation chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Yep, they'd heard the gospel, but they don't walk in it. Verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out, poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. And they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. All right, let's take a look at Revelation 18.8. Uh, Revelation Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Well, didn't this Stanley guy talk about death 
and famine. Oh yeah, he sure did. And great catastrophes. Well, guess what? Didn't Houston just get hit with a uh, flood and a hurricane? Mexico City just got hit with a magnitude 7 point something or other earthquake. The Vir Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico got slammed by Hurricane Maria. Is that a coincidence? Do you know how many Marias, which is the Spanish way of saying Mar uh, Mary, you know, as in Mary, Joseph, Jesus. When you hear Jesus, that's how they pronounce Jesus. Hurricane Maria utterly destroyed Puerto Rico. I hear there's not there's no power in Puerto Rico. It's gonna, they, they say it's going to take three to six months to restore electricity to Puerto Rico. It was wiped out. And what about Florida? The, the Florida Keys, Naples, Fort Myers. They just got hit with Irma. I mean, let's face it, this is all within, what, a month? He said, there shall be a lingering death, famine, and great catastrophes. All right, let's read the second paragraph by Stanley here. That's the end of my commentary. And I quote, My wrath shall be manifested against all ungodliness. It shall come with great intensity. You have known my love, but have not known my wrath, my severity. My judgments are literal and not a thing to be lightly passed over. Realize the severity of my judgments and my intense anger against the sin in my household. Ooh. And my intense anger against the sin in my household. My judgments shall begin in my house. For I will cleanse my house, that it be not partaker of my wrath against the iniquities of the cities. Before I visit the nations in judgment, I will begin at my house. When I do cause my wrath to come upon the cities of the world, my people shall be separate. I desire a people without spot or wrinkle, and such shall be, and such shall be preserved by me in the time of my wrath coming upon all iniquity and unrighteousness. I don't know how people can read this and think that this is not real. I mean, this guy is not, he's not uh, puffing up himself. This is, when I read this, this is right out of the Old Testament, right out of the New Testament. So let's take a look at my commentary. This That's the end of chapter, I mean, paragraph two. All right, so Stanley here talked about judgment starting at his house. Well, where have we read that? How about 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17? Peter writes, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Good question. Good question, right? All right, so what about um, when he said he wanted a, a, a house without spot or wrinkle? How about Ephesians chapter 5? Verse 25, God commands, and I read, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. 
that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Wow. Here's something, something very humbling. Isaiah 14.21 Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. Doesn't sound like God's too pleased with cities, huh? Cities are always a hotbed of wickedness. All right, so let's read the third paragraph. And I quote, I am going to prepare you for the coming days by a hard path that will cause you to cry out continually unto me. For when the going is easy, men do not seek me, but rejoice in a temporary blessing. And when that blessing is removed, they so often turn his way and that way, but do not come to me. I am showing you these things that you may seek me continually and with great diligence as you seek me. I will open up truths to you. I will open up truths to you that you have not seen before. And these very truths will be that which will enable you to stand in these last days. As you are persecuted, reviled, and rejected by your brethren, then you will turn unto me with all your heart and seek me for that spiritual life you have need of. And when tribulation comes, you will have that which will enable you to stand. For many will be tossed to and fro. Men's hearts shall fail them because of trouble on every hand. For these days shall be very terrible, the like of which has never been seen before. All right, that's the end of the third paragraph. Let's do a commentary on it. All right, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, let's see, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah. You notice God makes a distinction between Israel and and Judah, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, who is Jacob? Jacob was the name of the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac, and his name was changed to Israel. He was the father of the twelve tribes. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. 
For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their king, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. And guess what? Christ was of the line of David. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Oh yeah, you better believe you're going to get correction and punishment. For thus saith the Lord, Thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee. They seek thee not, for I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. Why criest thou? Didn't we read that? He said that we would cry out. Uh, didn't Stanley say that? Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. Therefore all that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. And they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. And that's P-R-E-Y. Uh, when, uh, when a falcon swoops down on a mouse, the mouse becomes the prey. The falcon's the predator. We're not talking about praying to the Lord, P-R-A-Y. And all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tent, and have mercy on his dwelling places, and the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry, and I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Wow. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me. I will punish all that oppress them. And their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governors shall proceed from the midst of them. And I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is he, this that engaged his heart, to approach unto me, saith the Lord? And ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. What people have been the people of God. What people built churches, printed Bibles, spread the gospel? Certainly not black Africa, certainly not yellow Asia, certainly not brown uh, Central and South America. No. No, it's Europe and the United States. It was white Christians that built churches that printed the Bibles, that spread the gospel. Let's face it, people. The world would never even heard of the name of Jesus Christ if it wasn't for missionaries going to all parts of the world. You can call it racist all you want. 
but you can argue with Christ when you meet him. Verse 22, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Listen carefully, Irma, Harvey, Maria, behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury. What's a hurricane? A whirlwind. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, in the latter days, ye shall consider it. Latter means last, people. All right, let's keep going. All right, remember he talked about there would be persecution? Well, guess what? There's going to be persecution, people. Christians have always been persecuted. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Isn't that what Stanley said? We would be reviled? Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Yeah, I know about that. I've been called a racist, homophobe, a wicked... Uh, you name it, I've been anti-Semite, I've been called everything. For those of you that are thinking about getting into ministry, let me tell you something. If you don't have a thick skin and you can't take this stuff, stay out of it. That's my suggestion. I mean, people have the love of Christ in their hearts and they think, I'm going to go out and try to reach the lost. And then they get called all kinds of names and wicked things, and, you, you know, what do you expect? I mean, look at who was following Christ around, and, and they called him all kinds of names, said that he was performing his miracles by the power of Beelzebub, which is another name for Satan or one of his generals, and said all kinds of lies about him. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen for that. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Oh yes, people, that's so wonderful. All right. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 20. Jesus speaking, Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Why are they keeping your sayings? So that they can use your, their, your words against you, for example, in a court of law. Ooh, that Bob, he's a racist. He's a homophobe. He's an anti-Semite. You watch, people. The day is coming. We're going to be dragged in the courts of law and charged with anti-Semitism. And the penalty will be death. Oh, and if you don't want to die, well, just deny Jesus. But Jesus said, if you deny me before men, that he would deny us before the Father and his angels. So, how about 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted, 
and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Wow. So, you know, we're going to be persecuted. That's, that's a given, people. All right, so, and let's face it. If you've ever read the book of uh, Judges, when things were good, people got fat and happy. They forgot all about the Lord. Well, then the Lord got tired of them being this way, and he sent persecution against them. And when they were enslaved, well, they cried out to God and repented of their wickedness and turned from their wicked ways. And then the Lord delivered them. You ever read of Samson? Samson delivered, helped deliver them from the Philistines. So, God wants a people without spot and blemish. So, what else do we have to take a look at? All right, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into uh, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to, to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. All right, let's read the next paragraph. Stanley, and I quote, When I visit my people in mighty revival power, it is to prepare them for the darkness ahead. With the glory shall come great darkness, for the glory is to prepare my people for the darkness. I will enable my people to go through because of the visitation of my spirit. Take heed to yourselves. In other words, pay attention. Take heed to yourselves lest you be puffed up and think that you have arrived. Many shall be puffed up as in the olden days, for many then received my message but they continued not in it. Did I not anoint Jehu? And if you don't know the... Well, I'll get back to that. Okay. Yet the things I desired were not accomplished in his life. Listen to the messengers, but do not hold men's persons in admiration. For many whom I shall anoint mightily with signs and miracles shall become lifted up and shall fall by the wayside. I do not this willingly. I have made provision that they might stand. I call many into this ministry and equip them. But remember that many shall fall. They shall be like bright lights, and the people shall delight in them. But they shall be taken over by deceiving spirits, and shall lead many of my people astray. Wow. All right, so they talk about uh, revival and the Spirit. So let's go to Joel chapter 2, verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that 
I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. So yes, God's going to pour out his spirit. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 13, verse 9. But take no heed to yourselves, for when they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues, and who hangs out in the synagogues? And in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. And But when, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Amen. You know, I, I, you know, I, uh, I hear people say once saved, always saved, and eternal security. But when I read in Matthew chapter ten and verse twenty-two, Jesus says, "And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved." You know, you know, people are going to be. Given the power of God, they're gonna and they're gonna do signs and miracles and wonders, but but this guy says that they're gonna fall by the wayside and then they'll devolve into being taken over by deceiving spirits and lead many people astray. And I kind of wonder about that because Balaam was a prophet of the Lord, and then he left the Lord and went and wanted to prophesy for, for money, for gain. All right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 8. I guess we'll start at uh, verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and, sp and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Jesus speaking, right? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Isn't that interesting? Jesus spoke in parables so that when they could see, they, they didn't see it. And when they heard, they didn't understand. Can you believe Christ was hiding the gospel from some people? It's what it sounds like to me. Now, verse 11. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh, taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. 
And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. And there are people that will tell you that all these people are saved. I have a hard time believing that. I think only the people on the good ground are saved. You know? But that's just my opinion. All right, let's go back. Next paragraph. Stanley says, Hearken diligently concerning these things. For in the last days shall come seducing spirits that shall turn many of my anointed ones away. Many shall fall through divers' lusts, and because of sin abounding. But if you will seek me diligently, I will put my spirit within you. When one shall turn to the right hand or to the left, you shall not turn with them, but keep your eyes holy on the Lord. Um, that's holy as in W-H-O-L-L-Y. That means keep your eyes completely on the Lord. The coming days are the most dangerous, difficult, and dark. But there shall be a mighty outpouring of my Spirit upon many cities, and many shall be destroyed. My people must be diligently warned concerning the days that are ahead. Many shall turn after seducing spirits. Many are already seducing my people. It is those who do righteousness that are righteous. Many cover their sins by great theological words. But I warn you of seducing spirits who instruct my people in an, in an evil way. Many of these shall I anoint, that they may purify and sift my people, for I would have a holy people. Wow. Seducing spirits, where have we read that? Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, now the Spirit, what Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, people, I think, I don't know. All right, let's, uh, let's read the next paragraph. Many shall come with seducing spirits and hold out lustful enticements. You will find that after I have visited my people again, the way shall become more and more narrow, and fewer shall walk therein. But be not deceived, the ways of righteousness are my ways. For though Satan come as an angel of light, hearken not to him. For those who perform miracles and speak not righteousness are not of me. Let's read that again. For those who perform miracles and speak not righteousness are not of me. I warn you with great intensity that I am going to judge my house and have a church without spot or wrinkle when I come. I desire to open your eyes and give you spiritual understanding that you may not be deceived, but, but may walk with uprightness of heart before me, loving righteousness and hating every evil way. Look unto me, and I will make you to perceive with the eyes of the Spirit the things that lurk in darkness that are not visible to the human eye. Wow, I just got a chill up my spine reading that. Let me lead you in this way that you may perceive the powers of darkness and battle against them. It is not a battle against flesh and blood, for if you battle in that way, you accomplish nothing. But if you let me take over and battle against the powers of darkness, then they are defeated, 
and then liberation is brought to my people. Let's face it, people. Jesus did a lot of miracles, right? Did he preach righteousness? Oh, yeah. Jesus preached righteousness. He told people to repent. Oh, yeah, he did. So, all right, let's take a look. All right, Revelation 13. And he, the false prophet, and he exerciseth, I think it's a false prophet, and he, talking about the unholy trinity, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that, to, of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which with which he deceived, deceived them, that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. All right, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse uh, verses chapter one through nine or so. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Do you know that Judas Iscariot was called the son of perdition? But there's going to be another son of perdition. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only who, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness ah unrighteousness and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give 
Thanks always to God for you, beloved brethren of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Ooh, that sounds like Calvinism. Because God hath chosen you, I'm sorry, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and, I'm sorry, in every good word and work. All right, back to Stanley. Next paragraph. I warn you to search the scriptures diligently these last days. For the things that are written shall indeed be made manifest. I want to make a note here. You know why I believe this guy? Because this speaks to the Spirit. There's a lot of Pentecostals that will tell you that, oh, well, we don't need the Bible. We've got God's Spirit. And yes, there's a lot of Pentecostal churches that will tell you that they don't need the Bible because they've got the Holy Spirit, and we speak in tongues, and we're led by the Spirit. And then they'll do things that are against what the Bible says to do. And if you're interested, uh, I did a Bible study on speaking in tongues, which, you know, the Bible says, well, let's take a look. All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, um, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, now this is... Pentecostal churches do not usually follow this. Not all of them, but generally the, the most of them. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, in other words, let you know one after the other, not everybody jabbering at the same time, and let one interpret. So let's read that again. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. So when you got 50 people in a Pentecostal church all going, it's the wrong spirit, people, if you believe Paul, and I do. But that's why I believe this guy, this Stanley Frodham, Frodsham. So let's go back to that paragraph again. I warn you to search the scriptures diligently these days. For the things that are written shall indeed be made manifest. There shall come deceivers among my people in increasing numbers, who shall speak forth the truth and shall gain the favor of the people. For the people shall examine the scriptures and say, What these men say is true. Then, when they have gained the hearts of the people, then and then only shall they bring out these wrong doctrines. Ooh. Therefore, I say that you should not give your hearts to men, nor hold people's persons in admiration. For by these very persons shall Satan enter into my people. Watch for seducers. Do you think a seducer will brandish a new heresy and flaunt it before the people? He will speak the words of righteousness and truth and will appear as a minister of light, declaring the world, uh, I'm sorry, declaring the word. The people's hearts shall be won. Then when the hearts are won, they will bring out their doctrines, and the people shall be deceived. The people shall say, 
Did he not speak thus and thus? And did we not examine it from the word? Therefore, he is a minister of righteousness. Boy, isn't that the truth? This that he has now spoken, we do not see in the word, but it must be right, for the other things he spake, he spoke were true. Ooh. Be not deceived, for the deceiver will first work to gain the hearts of many, and then shall bring forth his insidious doctrines. You cannot discern those who are of me and those who are not of me when they start to preach. But seek me constantly, and then when these doctrines are brought out, ye shall have a witness in your heart that these are not of me. Fear not, for I have warned you. Many will be deceived. But if you walk in holiness and uprightness before the Lord, your eyes shall be opened, and the Lord will protect you. If you will constantly look upon the Lord, you will know when the doctrine changes and will not be brought in. I'm sorry, and will not be brought into it. If your heart is right, I will keep you. And if you will look constantly to me, I will uphold you. All right, next paragraph. The minister of righteousness shall be on this wise. His life life shall agree with the word, and his lips shall give forth that which is wholly true, and it will be no mixture. When the mixture appears, then you will know he is not a minister of righteousness. The deceivers speak first the truth and then error to cover their own sins which they love. The deceivers speak first the truth and then error to cover their own sins, which they love. Therefore I exhort and command you to study the scriptures relative to seducing spirits, for this is one of the great dangers of these last days. Wow. I desire you to be firmly established in my word and not in the personalities of men. my note real quick. It's too bad people don't take this to heart and examine those on TBN. I desire you to be firmly established in my word and not in the personalities of men, that you will not be moved as so many shall be moved. I would keep you in the paths of righteousness. Take heed to yourselves and follow not the seducing spirits that are already manifesting themselves. Diligently inquire of me when you hear something that you have not seen in the word. And do not hold people's persons in admiration. For it is by this very method that Satan will hold many of my people. I love this. Next paragraph. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Isn't that exactly what Christ said? I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, that you may walk triumph where I triumphed. On the cross, I triumphed over all the power of Satan, and I have called you to walk in the same path. It is when your life is on the cross that you shall know the victory I have experienced. As you were on the cross and seated in me, then you shall know the power of the resurrection. When I come in my glory, the principalities and powers in the heavenly places shall be utterly broken. Fear not, for I have given you power, whereby you may tread down the powers of darkness and come forth victorious through every trial. As you are on the cross, then you are victorious. It was on the cross that I triumphed over all the powers of my enemy. My life shall flow through you as you enter into these precious truths. Look unto me and appropriate my life as your eyes and desires are toward me and you know what it is to be crucified with me. Then you shall live and your anointing shall increase. 
it was not in my life that I walked upon the earth, but it was in my life when I was upon the cross that I openly spoiled principalities and powers. I am showing you truths that shall cause you to overcome and have power over the wicked one. To have you, to have, I'm sorry, I am showing you truths that shall cause you to overcome, to have power over the wicked one, truth that will liberate you and those round about you. You shall know also the fellowship of my sufferings. My note. You don't hear that anymore in church. Sufferings. Oh no. Well, let's preach the pre-trib rapture. You shall know also the fellowship of my sufferings. There is no other way whereby you may partake of his heavenly glory and reign with me. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. That's right out of the Bible. I desire to make those truths real within you. As you keep them before you, you will liberate many who are in bondage. You will have revelation of those who who are in darkness and will have the keys to liberate the captives. Many seek to liberate, but they have not the keys. Upon the cross continually, you will know the power of my resurrection, that you may also partake of my glory, as you are willing to walk with me and rejoice in your sufferings. You shall partake of my glory. Look upon me, for you have need of power to overcome the wicked one and the bondages in other lives. Next paragraph. If you will indeed judge yourself, you shall not be judged. A lot of the stuff, my note, a lot of the stuff is right out of the words of Christ's mouth. If you will indeed judge yourself, you shall not be judged. As you seek my face and desire to be cleansed by me in all truth and sincerity heart, I will judge you in the secret place. And the things that are in the secret place of your heart shall not be made manifest to others. I will do it in the secret place, and no man shall know it. And the shame that shall be seen on many faces shall not be seen on your face. Therefore, in love and mercy, I am instructing you. And therefore, I have said that if a man judge himself, he shall not be judged. Is it not my good pleasure that the shame of my people be seen by all? How can I judge the world if I judge not my fir uh, How can I judge the world if I judge not first my own house? Hearken unto these things I am telling you. If you will not hearken unto me, thy shame shall be evident to all. My note, the thing about us being judged in the secret place, I have never heard read that in the Bible that I can recall. I'm not 100% sure that's true, but everything else seems to line up, so I don't know. All right, next paragraph. I would have you consider my life on earth. The anointing upon me was great, and yet the temptations were great on every side, in one form and then in another, offering me first the glory of the kingdoms of the earth, and then reviling and persecuting me. There will be great glory given to my people, and yet the temptations shall be intensified from every side. Think not that with the glory there shall not be there, there shall be no temptations or persecutions. The glory of my church shall be great, and so shall be the temptations from the enemy to turn my people from their from my paths. I am warning you that when the glory shall be manifested, the temptation shall be great, until very few that start shall finish. First, there shall be offered them great worldly possessions, and then great revilings and unbelief. Next paragraph, consider your Lord, that as he walked, so it shall be for you. There shall be need of great intensity of purpose. At times, everyone 
shall rise up against you simply to turn you from the course that I would put you in. It is written of me that I set my face as a flint to go to the direction my father had prescribed for me. If you will finish the course the Lord has laid down for you, you will have to set your face as a flint. With great determination you must walk in the course laid down for you. Many of your loved ones and those who follow with you shall persuade you and try to turn you from the course. With many words that seem right in the natural, will they speak to you? Did not Christ rebuke Peter, who would not turn him from the course God had prescribed? Understand these two things and meditate upon them solemnly. The persecution and the darkness shall be as great as the glory in order to try to turn the elect and the anointed ones from the path the Lord has laid down for them. Many shall start. But few, few shall be able to finish because of the greatness of grace that shall be needed to be able to endure unto the end. The temptations and the persecutions of your Lord was continuous. He was tempted by Satan in many forms throughout his, life, his entire life, and even to the cross when the ungodly cried out, If thou be the Christ, come down from the cross. Think not that there shall be a time of no persecution, for it shall be from, time, from the time of your anointing until the end. Difficulties and great persecution to the end. The Lord must prepare you to be an overcomer in all things, that you may be able to finish the course. The persecution shall increase even as the anointing shall increase. In paths of judgment and righteousness, shall the Lord God lead his people and bring them into that place which he hath, has chosen for them. For the Lord has chosen a place for his people, a place of righteousness and holiness where he shall encamp round about them. And all who will be led of the Lord shall be brought into this holy place. For the Lord delights to dwell in his people and to manifest himself through his people. The holiness of the Lord shall be manifested through his people. Let the Lord lead you, and he will lead you in difficult places. He led his people of old through a place where no man dwelt, where no man had passed through, in a place of great danger and in the shadow of death. The Lord will indeed again lead his people through such places, and yet he will bring them out into a place of great glory. Understand that the way toward the glory is fraught with great danger, and many shall fall to the right or to the left. Many shall camp on lesser ground, but the Lord has a place of holiness, and no unclean thing shall dwell among his people. Put your trust in him, and he will bring you into a place of holiness. His de he desires to bring his people into great glory, the like of which has never been seen, for what the Lord will do for those who put their trust in him, it is a place of darkness and great danger that separates his people into the place he would have them walk. He will protect them from the voices that would turn them from his path. He will bring them through the dark places and through the treacherous paths out into the light of his glory. He will rejoice greatly over his beloved and cause you to be filled with joy unspeakable. He seeks to lead his people into a new place of grace and glory, where he will indeed encamp among them. Put your trust in him, and he will surely bring you into this new place. Fear not the days to come, but fear this only, that you shall walk in a manner pleasing to the Lord. In this time I am ordering and setting up my church, and it shall indeed be pure, without spot or wrinkle. I will do work in my beloved that has not been seen since the foundation of the world. I have shown you these things that ye may seek the Lord diligently with all your heart, and that you may be a preserver of his people. Run not to this one nor to that one, for the Lord has so ordained, so ordained that salvation is in him and in him alone. You shall not turn to this shepherd or to that one. For there shall 
be a great scattering upon the earth. Therefore look unto him, for he will indeed make these things clear to you. Ye shall not look here nor there, for the wells that once had water shall be no more. But as you diligently seek him, he shall increase your strength and your faith, that he may be able to prepare you for this time that is coming. The truths that I have revealed to you must become a part of you, not just an experience, but a part of your every nature. Is it not written that I demand truth in the inward parts? Is it the truth of the Lord expressed in your very being that shall hold you? Many shall experience the truth, but the truth must become a part of you, your very life. As men and women look upon you, they will hear not only the voice, but see the expression of the truth. Many shall be overcome because they are not constant in my ways, and because they have not permitted the truths to become part of them. I am showing you these things that ye may be prepared, and having done all, to stand. That, everybody, is the end of Stanley Frodsham's, what he says is his prophetic warning of 1965. I tell you what, I see a lot of truth in this. I'm not saying 100% he's a prophet of God, but I tell you what, I just don't see how Satan could fake something as somebody that talks about holiness and righteousness. So, all right, everybody. Well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. I hope you'll pay attention to this. Persecution's coming. We must walk in truth, righteousness, and holiness before the Lord and seek His face always. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus, who is the Christ, in His precious name. Amen.